Hey everyone, Sleepy Reader here. Um, I had a little bit of extra time, so I have some more comics that I read in the last few days. So I've been slow getting through all my comics. Some of these maybe go back a few weeks. Um, especially Monstrous, which I'll talk about at the end. So anyway, uh, most of these are ones that I liked, but I had whatever reservations about. Um, Starfire number six was fun. Um, I guess it's getting a little bit, my daughter is so, um, sensitive about violence, about blood that I can't read this with my daughter anymore. So I'm reading it on my own and I'm enjoying it, but do I, with so many comics out there, if, if I'm not getting the kind of double bang for my buck with this, for my daughter and myself enjoying it, I'm not sure whether to keep getting it. Um. I will kind of miss it, so I'm not sure. We'll see. I, it's still officially on my pull list. Um, I like. I still love these chapter headings. I'm okay. You're okay. Let's eat, for instance. Um, I liked the way she handled this assassin and from Tamaran and chose not to um, not to kill. That's interesting, and I'd like more exploring about her evolution as a earthbound hero and and who she was before i don't know how much of that was in her old comic um red hood and the outlaws uh, i have sort of assumed this is kind of a soft reboot from red hood and the outlaws this is the new uh starfire but but i'm not totally sure it feels like um like the artist lupicino is that how you say her name somehow imagine she's a woman living in Italy. Her name is Emanuela Lupicino. It feels like her arts, her art was always good, but it feels like it's getting even more confident and strong. Um, the action scenes are exciting. The humorous scenes are exciting. The, the panel to panel storytelling really rocks. So, you know, if you wanted a kind of light Starfire comic and were older than my daughter, maybe 10 and up, I think this would be quite a good comic. Um, it's maybe still aimed at, I think they're thinking women 16 to 22 or something, because there's, you know, sexual jokes and, and the like in here. Nothing very explicit, but people jumping into bed together and, and that sort of stuff. What age is I Hate Fairyland for? God, this, you know, last issue was bloody. This ups the bloodiness factor. Um, it's kind of, uh, if anyone's ever heard the term that they sometimes use uh, for horror, you know, extreme horror, grand gugnol, uh, I think which comes from a kind of Italian play that was very violent in the medieval ages. I don't know, Italian, French. Anyway, uh, this is like a grand gugnol of uh, cartoon level violence and gross out stuff. <coughs> It was pretty funny. You know, I was worrying after the first issue that it was kind of a a one-joke thing um, that's going to be stretched out over multiple issues. He has found, you know, some new little twists to the one-joke, like fawns being turned into um, zombies, which again is a uh, kind of a a single-joke thing. I think I feel like I've gotten enough of the fawn zombies already. <clears throat> Now, whether next issue will include a very long fight with the fawn zombies or whether we'll just jump over that, having had our visual gag about just how many fawn zombies there are, I don't know. And there was, because the reason I say that is at the end of the last issue, this guy called the Huntsman was coming after her. But at the beginning of this issue, she'd already killed the Huntsman and was getting drunk at a bar with his severed head next to her on the bar. And I did like that. I thought that was clever, not to show a big battle with Huntsman, just show afterwards. Um, another sort of positive thing here is we get a little hint of the, um, a little hint more of the 37-year-old woman stuck in this child body. Obviously, it's a 37-year-old woman who decided to become a psychotic murderer. <laughs> so what do you do with that? Um, 
So I guess what I'm saying is I, I got a little more out of this than I expected. So I might pick up issue three. I'm not putting it on my pull list. I'm playing it issue by issue. Um, and hopefully they'll always have copies of it at my store. I did enjoy, I mean, ironically, because of all the blood and everything, I did just enjoy the bright colors and the, the fun stuff here. I'm a little turned off by the preview of next issue's cover, which is just a picture of her beaten up face. In a way, this feels like porn. I feel like it's, I have to hide it from my wife and daughter and not let them know I'm reading it. Um, because if they knew, they would be horrified. <clears throat> and uh, on the more traditional horror front, BPRD, Hell on Earth. This was a pretty good issue. The current artist is like a, um, is an artist who does a decent job but doesn't kind of blow your mind with anything. And there's a greater sense of, photoshopped things in um it seems like maybe every four to six issues you get a different artist on on um bprd and this this artist has been a little less inspiring to me but i i really like this character whose name i've already forgotten who is some kind of he's he's a body floating inside of this robot body i guess um, we got a lot of people inside of robot bodies in this book, at least three, um, in one form or another. And apparently he's some previous bad guy who's now helping them fight off these Lovecraftian creatures who've taken over Earth. The weird thing, though, is this is 137. I think I jumped on on 124 or maybe even sooner than that, 122, 121. I can't remember. Um, but I still, it, it like for a while I felt like I was understanding everything, but now they've, they're hearkening back to stuff that I still don't understand. I still don't understand who the black flame is and if that's the same or different from these creatures taking over earth. Um, I, I know who Liz is from the movies. Um, but I, because of the way things are drawn, I guess. I guess that's Liz, so she has fire powers. Um, I just keep feeling like I've missed a whole lot um, after having read, you know, 15 or more issues, um, which is just kind of a weird feeling. Um, but I'll continue to get it. There's something about the vibe of BPRD that's, it's very restrained, and there's something pleasing about that, kind of the exact reverse experience of I Hate Fairyland, or even the reverse of Starfire. Um, it's just got its own thing, and that's that's very pleasurable. Okay, Limbo, number one. I was worried when I picked this up that it would be all about music and magic, and I guess there's something about music and magic in here, but it really doesn't dominate. It's more... It's about... It's like a crime noir slash New Orleans slash Mexican. I don't even know... If, if this takes place in an imaginary city or a real city, it feels very New Orleans-ish, but there's also Mexican kind of, like me people who dress like Mexican wrestlers, and of course, the Day of the Dead, although they might celebrate the Day of the Dead in New Orleans for all, New Orleans for all I know. I've never been there. Um, the art and the cool coloring, the cooling, <laughs> the art and the coloring are pretty cool. Um, I think I won't put it on my pull list, but I'll probably pick up issue two to see if it involves me more. <clears throat> um, yeah, like I like the idea of these underworld villains who somehow dabble in magic and dress like Mexican wrestlers and that whole sort of thing and people with masks and everything like that. It's very cool, but I, I guess I'm not terribly concerned about this guy with amnesia wanting to find out his memory and I'm not that involved in his private eye case um, so yeah it's kind of like a it's a good comic that I feel like I could take or leave in that sense so on that level I think I'm getting extremely picky with there's been so many good books in the last I don't know four years I sort of count it starting at 
saga, although obviously there's been some very good books before saga. But um, s since saga, things have, I really noticed all these high quality uh, indie books, mostly image. And, um, and there's so many of them that you have to make, you have to make me really care sometimes um, to keep me going. So I, I, that, I feel funny. I want to give this a good review, so to speak. I want to tell people this is a good book. But on the other hand, I'm not sure if I'm going to keep reading it or not. It's just kind of will depend on my mood or maybe, maybe uh, you know, if I have a really fat stack the week issue two comes out, I might not get it. But if I do get it, I might end up really loving it. So I feel like I might be missing something if I let it go. Okay, this is a complicated one. Monstrous by Marjorie Liu, who's done some X-Men and other stuff for Marvel and is also a, I believe, a romance writer or maybe what they call a paranormal romance writer. I'm not sure which because I haven't checked out what her bibliography is for her fiction. And someone named Sana Takeda, who I gather from the... Um, Back Matter is a Japanese artist uh, living in Japan. Marjorie Liu talks about being the daughter, the second generation daughter of Chinese immigrants to the United States and talks about her um, grandparents' experiences during World War II um, and all kinds of horrific stuff going on in camps and other things in China is kind of we hear much more about what happened in Europe than happened in China it was certainly horrific but I, okay she says this was inspired by listening to Janet Jackson in her car and good thing I didn't read that line before I read this issue because yeah I, I don't take Janet Jackson too seriously so um <clears throat> This is 66 pages of story, so it's it's literally three issues in one. Um, so the, pri the the high price was actually a very low price. Um, very high quality comic book, very high quality art and um, coloring and paper quality, and the writing is very intense. There's no skimping here. This is not um, like uh, with the God Damned. That was an extra long issue, but it felt like it was just stretched out. There's no stretching out here. This is dense. Um, and despite the density, at the end of this issue, I don't know for sure where we're going next. I don't know what kind of story we're in. I mean, I know we're in a horrifying story full of torture and warring races of human-like characters. Um, and I guess... I now know that this character was sneaking into kind of a torture camp to um, both exact revenge and get this artifact. I'm not sure what the artifact does. Um, I guess I gather from the end of this issue that it's in danger of turning her into a monster. Um, I'm really not sure what her goals are. I assume because of all the torture and horrific stuff, I mean, images of adults torturing children although adults who don't consider the children human because they have wings or foxtails or something um have very visceral kind of feelings about torture and and truly evil characters who love torturing these children um so this is intense intense stuff and i'll you know 100 percent pick up the next issue to find out more but I am left, you know, sort of amazed that I read 66 pages and it it was quite a commitment to read it. I mean, it was literally like sitting down and reading a graphic novel. It was not like reading an issue of a comic. Um, so after putting all that in, I'm just amazed I don't know more than I do. I know a lot about, uh, about a very focused point in this sort of world of torture. There's, there's still things that aren't made explicit here. <clears throat> after all these 66 pages there's talk about eating people but there's also talk about maybe like draining some magic essence out of them to use for something and there's talk about a metal called ilium 
And there's always a danger in complicated fantasy stories of leaving things vague. I think it's a temptation for the writers. They have it in their head, but it, they're worried it won't sound as good if they make it explicit. But if it's not explicit, after a while, you're, just, you're surrounded by too much vagueness. So I kind of love this, but I'm nervous about it at the same time. Uh, another odd thing about it, I felt, was the coloring. Uh, it, when I flipped through it, I thought, God, I'm going to hate this art because everywhere I look is just um, one shade of coloring, basically. Either a goldish or brownish hue or a bluish hue or greenish hue, and that's about it. But uh, panel by panel, it seemed brilliantly colored. But, I, you know, 66 pages of this, I did crave some splashes of colors within a different palette um, because even on you know it might shift to kind of a blue tone but still it's always in this kind of grayish metally tone uh, interesting choice and it, it does it does fit in the indoor scenes and the like so I, mean, I basically highly recommend monstrous uh, despite my quibbles with it or my uncertainties about it um, clearly a writer and an artist team trying to give us you know their maximum effort and um and as a, a sort of lush nightmare it really succeeds so yeah um oh one other thing i uh, digitally something that i guess will be probably coming out next week or in a week or two on um as a physical thing or a digital first one of those DC Digital Firsts, uh, I read the first two episodes, so basically the first, I guess, 20 pages of The Legend of Wonder Woman. If I hold it at a certain angle, it might read better. But anyway, um, by Rene DeLiz and Ray Dillon, but basically by Rene DeLiz, who I've never heard of, who has a pretty distinctive style. The, the coloring's pretty amazing, which I guess is by Ray Dillon. So, I mean, it's good to mention his name. It, it has amazing color. It's, um, it's yet another retelling of um, the formation of Themyscira and of the childhood, the raising of, of Wonder Woman, of Diana. Um, and it, it seems to have bits and pieces from old stories and just random idea new ideas thrown in by the writer um also so it's hard to tell at this point where it's going um or whether it'll be really awesome or just sort of so-so but it, it the first because i'm reading it in these digital chapters the first chapter was pretty dull and it was just all info dump but then it seemed to get very good in what in the print comic book will be the second 10 pages um and I will probably tonight read the third 10 pages because I noticed they just uh, put them up on their store. Um, but it is simply beautiful to look at. So um, at least on the digital screen, the colors just are, are so enjoyable. So um, I guess we always, do we always get kind of a variation of Diana um, rebelling against Hippolyta? Um, there's kind of a hint like almost a post-apocalyptic thing as if the worlds of men are gone um, that in the language of English is only in relics and stuff so I, I'm curious as to how that will play out um, and we get a golden stag is a golden stag usually from Arthurian legends or do they have that in Greek mythology too anyway for my friends who are interested in Wonder Woman and don't mind yet another retelling of the Wonder Woman story I think this is going to be a very interesting one I really wish I knew where this uh, Renee Deliz came from and why they decided to entrust her with the latest uh, Wonder Woman so I, I think it's going to be like a six issue miniseries when it comes out in print if I understand if I remember correctly what I read anyway I'll probably be back I keep hoping to do a sleepy vlog I have all kinds of subjects I want to ramble upon but that always takes a little more time a little more focus than i've had lately so i'll talk to you all later and uh oh yeah i buzzed my head um i hope you're having a good lead up to thanksgiving if you're in the u.s 
and otherwise just having a good middle of the week.